production of capital and not the fact that George Soros profited big time from the crash. George Soros, if you don't know it, is you know, one of the Jewish banksters behind the, who run the economy, control the Federal Reserve, and things like that. So um, the notion here is that, going back to what I said before, that much of their resentment is, toward this, is because Obama is not seen as a strong, tough guy, and that's part of the ressentment. And I use it a little bit more generally than Nietzsche. But there's a couple of other, there's a lot of questions, so I, I don't for, try to go on to it. We can talk about it afterwards. Um, a, a lot of the analysis, both the psychoanalytical part and the p political economy part uh, that you've given have been based on this idea of uh, uh, perceived attacks on masculine hegemony, um, uh, you know, the authoritarian personality, castration anxiety, effects of deindustrialization. Um, how do you how do you then account for the popularity? of the tea bag movement among women because obviously you know a lot of those are talking about attacks on masculinity women haven't been so affected certainly not directly from um deindustrialization because they were never such a big part of it in the first place you know that's a very good that's a very good question and the answer is that most of the women that are involved generally do tend to identify with fairly traditional kind of feminine roles that are complementary to authoritarian males. So for example, that woman that said she was a nurse. Uh, I mean, most of us owe something or other to nurses. They're very, very important. But nursing is still a very traditional female kind of role. So you know, you, know, you see this, and I think once upon a time, for full disclosure, Grace has been in some of my classes. You know, if you go back to, to uh, Kristen Luker's Motherhood and the Politics of Abortion, uh, one of the things that she argues there is that abortion is a referendum on the role of women. That the women who have jobs and careers and other sources of fulfillment are very pro-choice. The women who are either in traditional roles or full-time motherhood basically believe that this is what's important. So many of the movement, many of the women, now, I think the more interesting question that you raised, and I think it's an interesting question, and hopefully, Robert, maybe we can meet in 20 years from now to examine it. One of the very interesting things, that I don't have this fully analyzed here, is the ascendancy of uh, Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman. Because in a way, in a way, especially in the case of Palin, in many ways she's kind of a traditional woman. You know, she was really, you know, she, she, she hit her peak when she was president of the Wasilla PTA. Somehow, you know, it's the Peter Principle, when she showed as, you know, competent leader of the PTA, they made her mayor. And somehow, you know, running a town of 6,000, you know, even I could do that with all my chaos. They made her governor for, what was she there, for a year or something like that? She's not a quitter, but she, uh, she also went on. The fact is, though, the fact that she does maintain a certain kind of family and you know takes care of you know the child with Down syndrome, uh, supposedly the grandchild, but I'm not going to get into that family history that individualizes it. But there's a way in which her kind of candidacy and the power of Michelle Bachman does subvert the traditional female ideology. You know that again the geezers he'll remember when Phyllis Shafley made a career out of telling women they shouldn't have careers. And that voice isn't heard very much anymore. You're not, it, and this has to do with economic reasons. That very few, you know, very few people can afford to live entirely on their own incomes. Let's try the next one. Um, speaking of which, by the way, Sarah Palin. If you take, what's her full name? Does anybody remember? Dipshit. Yeah, you know, <laughs> whatever you take out, you take her real name and you flip it around in a in a uh, an anagram. And you get hot harpies. A hill, nausea, and that made the. I don't remember the long name, so it doesn't sound that fine. Um, you know, you you had me when you were talking about. Um, I mean, your analysis is very interesting. I think it's a little over the top on some points. The Freudian um, business, uh, I get it, um, but you really started to reach me when you started to talk about uh, Nietzsche and ressentiment. Uh, because it makes me, in a way, start to sympathize a little bit with their, with their situation, their concerns, because they are really uh, feeling uh, under, even if they aren't exactly under. This has been a very short uh, uh, um, 
left uh, advance in the last few years. But if you take Nietzsche's um, concept and you, you take the other side of ressentiment, which I believe is uh, the pathos of distance of the, the ruling class, uh, I, don't see, I don't see a pathos of distance that is a, a sort of an insensitivity on our part uh, as this sort of temporary ruling class uh, over these people. I think I, I tend to feel a little bit uh, sorry for them. And I do, uh, thanks to your, uh, your analysis, I do feel a little bit of uh, sympathy because we've all been there, uh, understand. Uh, yet, I, I think that um, if, if anybody does happen to have a pathos of distance towards um, uh, the uh, tea, tea baggers, it would probably be, uh, I think, the, the uh, Obama folks in power uh, and the problem, we already recognize the problematic issue with uh, Obama's choice of Rahm Emanuel and, and uh, some of these other folks at the very top. That uh, that we're already we're we're all a little bit concerned about. Uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel is almost as bad in some ways as Paul Wolfowitz was. So I mean, there there may be some sort of uh, maybe, uh, maybe 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 worse because he's effective. He's effective. He's actually having some effect. So uh, that's my feeling. Maybe you can you can speak a little about this. What's what do you think about the Obama administration, which I think is separate from the American liberal pub progressive public. Uh, their attitude toward the right, and how can you know? I'm sure they're not going to. They have no concern about them. Maybe you can speak to that. Well, uh, you know, actually, I can't really say a lot on that issue for for a number of reasons. But I do think the important thing here is the capacity, as you put it, that yeah, they are being hurt. And I think, as I, as I said in the very beginning, we can think of them as the canaries in the uh, mine shaft. Uh, because for a number of reasons, that's a whole different discussion. Come to the labor set, the labor meeting on May 1st. Uh, American society is going down the tubes. We pissed away our fortune largely on the military because there's an important lesson that history has told us. We can start with the Greeks, go through the Romans, uh, the Ottomans, the French, the English. There comes a time in the history of every hegemonic empire when it costs more to maintain the empire than the profit the power it produces. And that's not, namely what's happening to us. So. There, pardon? Don't forget the Spanish. Oh, right. there's about 50 more if I have the time. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but no, but the point here is that to a certain extent, much of their pain was kind of subdued for the previous eight years because one of their guys, some real kick ass, you know, anti intellectual guy who represented <clears throat> Christian values, <clears throat> was in power. And so, although many of them began to feel that pain just welled up, oh, you know, especially when, you know, you just see so many people that have basically had to move down economically, socially, to lower status kinds of jobs. Who, you know, many of them. I mean, the, the guy, and he wasn't a tea bag person, but the guy's, I was named Stark, who crashed the plane into the. Uh, uh, Texas, uh, the Austin IRS. Now, <clears throat> what the New York Times report was a good report. What they didn't mention, however, is that about 15 years ago, he had incorporated his uh, family into a church, or his, his house into a church, and basically claimed that all his income was tax-free. And the uh, government, the, the, the IRS didn't agree. I'm glad I found that out because I was about to establish my house to the church. And so, um, it, it, so, but in this case, if you look at the letter that he wrote, he was fair, it was a fairly intelligent, coherent letter, and much of it was very critical of the government for the reasons that you're pointing out. And so many of their objections have a ground. These people are generally distant from authority. These are not people who vote more often than not have a lot of political power. Yeah, they may have, you know, a few people like, you know, Michelle Bachman and, you know, in the Republican Party types, but that's pretty much on the way out. This is these are marginal people who are gaining belief. This is, you know, a very important thing and despite your criticism of psychoanalysis, and I know here I've mixed a lot of clinical with the, uh, theoretical, but a very common thing that, that one sees uh, in a more clinical thing <coughs> is the mechanism of, of acting out. Because acting out gives somebody a sense of agency as opposed to being powerless. So rather than sit and just moan, if you go to a demonstration, yo, freedom! That gives you a feeling of doing something. You can be doing something wrong, but it's